Hi, and welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast, where we talk about images and the people who make them. I'm Roger Sakala, the founder of LensRentals.com. Welcome to the Lens Rentals Podcast. I'm Joey Miller, senior tech here at LensRentals.com, and today I've got Emmy and Pulitzer Prize winning David Carson, photojournalist for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. How are you today, David? Great. Thanks for uh, having me on. I, I, it was a regional Emmy, too. I, should, I always try to be clarify that, that it wasn't a big, fancy national Emmy. <laughs> so. Okay, but it was a real Pulitzer. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> so... Let's uh, let's start with your background. You're originally from Boston, right? Yeah, I, um, I grew up most of my life in Boston, went to high school in Boston. I did spend a couple of years of my life uh, living in England because of my dad's job, but consider myself a, a Boston uh, native, you know, Red Sox fan, Patriots fan. I'm not going to hold that against you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, it's funny on uh, when I start talking about... Um, the Boston sports stuff on Twitter. I see my Twitter followers fall off and I'm like, I forewarned you. So, uh, so you, you had your first photojournalism assignment at 16. What, what got you into photography before that? You know, that that's a good question. Um, I'm actually named for my dad's best friend, uh, David Prentice, who was killed in the Vietnam War. And funny enough, his mother is the one who got me my first camera uh, when I was about eight years old. It was a little uh, Kodak 110 uh, point and shoot with one of those flash cubes on top and stuff. And so being, you know, like a true photographer that I am, I burned through that first roll of film in about five minutes. And, uh, you know, so I, I was always kind of interested in photography from a young age. And it's sort of interesting that she got me my first camera. But then I was... Uh, 14 years old or so like that. And we were at a, um, a Penn State football game uh, with my uh, grandfather and my dad. And uh, the day before we were at a, at a soccer game and my dad had his 35 millimeter Minolta around his neck that he'd picked up in the Vietnam War. I was like, dad, dad, can I use your camera? And he goes, oh, I, I don't know. And I'm like, no, 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 okay. Can I, I want to use your camera, go down on the field and take some pictures. And so I thought I was really special because I had talked my way onto the sidelines of a college soccer game and stuff. And I, I, I made some pictures down there and this was in like November. And I was like, all right, I, I know what I want for Christmas. I want a 35 millimeter camera just like this. My dad's like, you don't want this. You're never going to use a camera like this. You, what you want is you, you just want to point and shoot. I'm like, no, no, no. I want one like this with all the buttons and knobs and everything like that. And so that year for Christmas, you know, he got me a Pentax K1000 and, um, you know, I've sort of been going at it and acquiring cameras and lenses ever since. So I started like, you know, photographing friends, baseball games and sports and stuff and basketball. And I was remember being at a friend's baseball game and I looked across the field and there was the photographer from the local newspaper over there. And I'm like, he's getting getting paid to take pictures. I should get paid to take pictures. <laughs> and and I went over and I introduced myself to him. I said, hi, you know, how are you? I really like your work. You know, he's like, okay, kid, you know, whatever. And um, he actually brought me into my first dark room because I ran into another event. And uh, I was like, oh yeah, I'm I'm thinking about getting a dark room. And he could tell I was kind of interested in it. He invited me back to the newspaper that night. And he actually showed me how to make my first prints there in the newspaper dark room. So I was I was kind of hooked from that point on. I remember going in to tell my father too that I ah, I figured out what I want to do. Cause you know, when you're like a 15, 16 year old kid, you know, people always ask you, what are you gonna do? Like what what do you think you want to do? And I my my mom's a teacher and my dad's uh and my dad's an engineer. And so I remember thinking, I'm like, I don't know if they're gonna be down with this whole photo thing. And so I went into my dad and I was like, All right, I, I know what I wanna do, Dad, but I, I wanna be a photographer. He goes, Great. All right, kid. See ya. <laughs> and I was like, all right. Well, I got his, I got his blessing. So right. Well, they got to be proud of you now. Yeah, yeah. I think they, I think they were always proud of it. You know, they, they, they just didn't. I don't know. When a fifteen-year-old comes and tells you he's going to do something, I don't know how much you believe it. But in this, in this case, I said I was going to do something, and it, you know, it worked out. Yeah, absolutely. What was that? What was that first assignment you had? It was a baseball game. I think it was David Del Pollo, uh, who I then later worked with uh, later in my career at the Providence Journal, called me up and was like, "Hey, we got this this baseball game. Do you do you want to cover it?" And I was like, "Yeah, well, w one minute, mom, 
can I have a ride? <laughs> <laughs> and I, and she goes, where to? And I, so, you know, I called him back. Yes, yes, I, I can do that baseball game. It was a funny start to my career. Uh, and you went to, uh, you ended up going to Rochester Institute uh, of Technology for photojournalism, right? Right, right. I, um, you know, when I was growing up um, in Boston, uh, Stan Grossfeld uh, of the Boston Globe was winning Pulitzer Prizes and, you know, doing all this great work for the Boston Globe. And Stan Grossfeld went to RIT. And I was like, all right, well, that must be a good school. I, I want to go there. And I remember crossing paths several times with him when I was younger and stuff. I ran into him a few years ago during the uh, World Series when St. Louis played Boston. And I was like, you're someone I really looked up to when I was a kid. And he goes, you're really making me feel old. So, <laughs> so oh, that, but that's that, really that, cool. That, like that meeting your kind of, heroes. Like that, that's a, that's an awesome thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, and he was very cool. He was very cool when I was a young high school kid and he was very cool uh, when I just saw him a few years ago and stuff. So how did you get to uh, the St. Louis Post Dispatch? You've been there for 19 years now. Is that right? Yeah, I got here in 2000, you know, thought I'd be at the Post Dispatch for five years. And uh, that's what I told my you know, wife at the day. She wasn't my wife then. She We had been dating for a while and I was working down at the Naples Daily News as a staff photographer down there. And there was a, a group of great photographers we had down there. Um, I worked with a guy named Ben Gray, who went on to be the director of photography in Atlanta. Eric Strachan was down there and he was winning, uh, doing all sorts of great design work and really kind of setting the tone for, for that Naples being a great picture paper. Lisa Krantz was down there with when I was down there. And, she, you know, she's just a great photographer who does all this really wonderful in-depth uh, storytelling. Just uh, Dan Wagner was there. And it's like all these very talented photographers. And I kind of felt, you know, fortunate to be part of this group of photographers where we're all these like young guys kind of doing all this, you know, sort of really interesting work at this small paper down in Southwest Florida. And th that was really great. And I really loved it there. Um, but my wife had no interest in, my future wife had no interest at all in living in Florida. And so she was like, all right, we're both going to apply for jobs. Uh, she was also a journalist. Uh, she's a writer. She said, we're both going to apply for jobs. And the next person who gets a job at a big newspaper, you know, the other person will come along. I said, okay. And so we both started applying for some jobs and uh, I ended up getting the job up here in St. Louis. Neither one of us had ever been in St. Louis before. We didn't really know what to expect. Um, now I've been here 20 years. Um, three months before I lived in St. Louis, it was never really on my radar screen of places I thought I was going to live. But now I've been here 20 years. I have a 13-year-old daughter who is a St. Louisan. So that that's sort of an unusual unusual thing. She's a Cardinals fan as opposed to a Red Sox fan, despite my best efforts. But, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so that that's how I ended up here. It sounds like you really got your start in sports photography. Being in St. Louis, now you've been able to cover a World Series, a Stanley Cup. Tell me a little bit about doing those kinds of things. Yeah, you know, I don't really consider myself a sports photographer. We had a very talented sports photographer here, uh, Chris Lee, who would do all our sports all the time. So when I came to St. Louis, I started doing actually much less sports than what I was doing. You know, back when I was a young kid, I always I always loved sports and I played sports and it was something I was pretty good at. But I, I found that after I came to the Post-Dispatch, there was also a bunch of other talented sports photographers. Um, and so I, I really wasn't doing much sports. And what happens is, is that, you know, the Cardinals would get into the playoffs and I'd get brought in as an editor or, or part-time shooter on this stuff. And the other reason why I would get involved with the sports was that I was uh, pretty good at editing and captioning and solving technical problems that would come up. And so they're like, okay, you sit here and edit and type and type a lot of captions. And if you're lucky, you'll get to do some shooting and stuff. So, so that, that was really a majority of my role for, for a lot of the sports coverage for the, you know, for the, for the start of it. Yeah. Cause I, I know the way that uh, I, I was at least connected with you is you, you had rented a couple of big lenses from us yes. for that world series. How often does that happen? Like how often do you end up having to supplement your gear uh, working at the paper? Yeah. So we, one of the things we really like about lens rentals is, you know, it's been a source of gear when we need something. And so I think that you know, the post-dispatch is not in a unique situation where, you know, because of budget cuts, we've not really kept up with the most modern equipment and stuff. Uh, you know, right now we're using eight-year-old uh, Canon 1DXs, the, the original ones, and uh, uh, 5D are my, are my two standardly issued bodies. And all of our lenses date uh, from at least 2004 back. Uh, we have one 600 F4, which dates from... Uh, the Mark McGuire home run chase back in the 90s. And so, 
you know, we would go to these baseball games and we would be totally outlensed by AP and Getty and everyone else. And we're like, okay, we've got the photographers with the talent to do this stuff, but it's going to really be helpful for us if we're able to have, you know, a 428. And, you know, we didn't have the money in the budget to buy a 428. And so we called lens rentals. And I think we, we borrowed two, two 428s from you guys multiple times during playoffs. So having all this older gear, how, how is the industry changing around you? How is it falling behind? How is it trying to stay ahead? How are you seeing that change affect you and how you have to do your work? Well, you know, I, I think what you're seeing uh, generally is, you know, a reduction of the number of staff photographers ar- around the country. And, I, you know, that's been happening in journalism as a whole. But what you see is that you see places like the New York Times and the Washington Post and others, they are adding journalists back to their newsroom, but they tend not to be adding uh, staff photographers. You'll see some more picture editors being added and stuff. You've not seen the the growth and the rehiring of staff photographers the way you've seen more journalists being, you know, more uh, word side journalists being added at these places. You know, the Washington Post has built up a huge video department now, right? So I think that some of these staff photographer positions have changed over to possibly like staff video positions and stuff. And I think I, I've not seen their numbers, but I clearly with the amount that they're investing in video, both the Washington Post and the New York Times are finding an outlet for their videos that maybe mid-sized regional papers like ours have not have not super found a way to to monetize yet. And I, I think that video is a wonderful storytelling tool. You know, at various times there's been these uh, thoughts of, oh, we're going to, you know, the industry is going to pivot to video. And that, you know, that didn't really work. You know, newsrooms were decimated all across the country by this concept that we're going to pivot to video. And some of that was based off of Facebook's overstating of you know, the numbers and the, and the metrics they were getting off of videos. You know, we we were not affected by that a lot in St. Louis. So like we didn't like decimate our newsrooms, but you saw a lot of other news organizations decimated by this uh, pivot to video that a lot of people were making because they thought that that was going to be the new revenue, revenue source to support journalism. And, you know, it turns out that that's not materialized at this point. I like video. I think it's got a, a wonderful role to play in journalism and it's a great tool, but I don't think it's this panacea for what's uh, this lack of revenue that that's needed to support journalism jobs in the industry right now. How many how many of your colleagues there at the Post Dispatch are trying to transition into video or trying to include a lot more video in their work? We have one photographer who's uh, who's our main video shooter, and the rest of us all have uh, video responsibilities at different time. I, the way I kind of do it is I see something and I'm like, oh, this is a video, and I sort of I transition very quickly over, over to that. Um, I don't always have the right microphones with it. I, sometimes I wish I was a little bit better prepared, but there are times I intentionally go out to shoot video and I, I have to have a different mindset because one of the things I've found too is that if I'm going to do video, I need to commit to doing video and, and realize I'm going to lose some stills at the expense of getting good video. Let's go back and talk about some of your other work you've done. Uh, so you, you've you been to Iraq and Afghanistan in 2004 and 2006, is that right? That's correct, yes. Uh, what were you doing over there? Like, What kind of stuff were you covering there? Uh, because I work for a, a regional newspaper at the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, when we're going to go to Iraq or we're going to go to Afghanistan, we're going to go with some sort of a local angle on it. You know, we're not going to try to cover the entire scope of the war and what's taking place. What we're going to do is we're going to look for stories that have some sort of local tie to the St. Louis region. And so when I went to both Iraq and Afghanistan, it was with the idea of covering what our national, our local National Guard troops were doing over there. We went over there and we did a story, but it was never the story we intended to do. Uh, we got got caught in this quagmire of governmental bureaucracy where we were, it was this uh, guy who was the U.S. Justice Department's liaison to the interim Iraqi government. It it was just all these layers of of government. And uh, we never actually got to do the story that we went over there to do, um, which was these local guys who were excavating um, mass graves in Kurdistan, then the the evidence that they gathered from that was going to be used to try Saddam Hussein. So you had all these local St. Louis guys up there in Northern Iraq, uh, west of Mosul, excavating graves. It was basically CSI Iraq and it was local guys doing it from St. Louis. And, you know, people had signed off on this and said we could do it. And then someone up there after we arrived on you know, in country decided we weren't going to do that story. And I was like, oh my God, I'm going to get fired. 
(laughs) We've spent all this money to buy health insurance and life insurance to get us here and plane tickets here. You know, we, we, we've easily spent $20,000 and now we're sitting in the middle of, of Baghdad and we don't have, we don't have the story we promised them we were going to do. That's just the fear you have when you're sitting over there. I don't think my boss was ever going to fire me for it, but it wasn't a good feeling to have your first big international trip go that, that poorly. So while we were over, while we were over there, we decided, um, all right, well, we're, we can't come back empty handed. We have to do something. Uh, the first billion dollars of U.S. reconstruction money had been spent when we were over there. So we're like, okay, we're going to do a story about how the reconstruction is going. And that actually, you know, turns into a much bigger story because of how futile at times that, that reconstruction effort seemed where, you know, they'd build these power plants and these power lines and then people would, you know, destroy them. They'd build schools and the schools would get blown up. Just all this infrastructure they're trying to build up that then the insurgents were trying to tear down at the same time. And so the story ended up working out okay, but um, it wasn't this great story that we intended to do when we went over there. And then it was the same thing we went to Afghanistan in 2006. It was you know, the guy who's the postman in St. Louis, well, now he's over in a, over in Afghanistan and he's training the Afghan National Army how to shoot artillery and, you know, doing these slices, these citizen soldier stories that that was what our goal was when we do a big trip like that. So that, that local interest angle, is that what led you to do uh, the reporting for duty project with Philip O'Connor? Yeah. So uh, Philip and I got working on that um, after the Afghanistan thing. And Phil and I had been in both Iraq and Afghanistan together. And so we had a good working relationship. Phil actually came up with this idea that he wanted to write a narrative on basic training and who are these guys that were signing up for the military in this time of war. And um, at the same time, the army was having a hard time recruiting guys. So they were lowering their standards and giving um, ethical or moral waivers or ethical waivers or something like that uh, so that they could get more recruits and stuff because they were not meeting their recruiting goals. And so we wanted to see like, what does basic training look like now? And so that that's, that's when we went in there. We didn't know who exactly we were going to follow when we went in. And so it was kind of just this process of going in and feeling it out and seeing which way it developed. Earlier, we were talking about cuts in the newspaper industry. And this story sort of fits in well with those cuts. Uh, Originally, what the plan was is that we were going to follow these recruits in from civilian life into basic training, you know, and and onto it as they're deployed out to Iraq and Afghanistan. And unfortunately, that was the the timing of that was coming in right at 2007 to 2008. Uh, And so the, the economy goes south and all the money for international trip like that disappeared. So while originally what we intended to do was to follow these guys in and then follow them over to Iraq and Afghanistan for another trip, we never ended up making that part of the trip uh, because we were in the middle of massive layoffs throughout the news industry across the country. Yeah. Coinciding right there with the uh, financial crisis. Right. Exactly. Yes. Well, we're going to take a quick break. uh, And when we come back, we'll talk about uh, your other award-winning coverage and maybe the future of photojournalism. Okay. Sounds great. brings you a meditation moment. Close your eyes. Lean back and listen to my voice. You feel yourself getting sleepy. Relax. Drifting on a cloud. You love this podcast. You want to give this podcast a five-star rating. You want to write a positive review of it and even subscribe to it you know that will bring you a feeling of joy and contentment. When I count to three, you will wake up refreshed and go straight to the review page. One, two, three. And we're back uh, talking to uh, David Carson, photojournalist for the St. Louis Post Dispatch. So let's um, let's get into some of your other field work. You were a finalist for the Pulitzer in 2009 for uh, you and your team 
for the coverage of uh, the Kirkwood City Hall shootings. Can you tell me about that some? Yeah, so the Kirkwood City Hall shootings uh, happened in 2009. It was actually on my birthday when it happened. I was actually not involved in the first night's coverage of it because we were driving, uh, my wife and I were driving to go and have dinner at, at a restaurant in town and we were first hearing about it. We're about a mile from the restaurant. We're starting to hear some stuff come across the next hill about a shooting and some of the other drivers were like, I got it. I'm close to it. I'm going to it. You know, unfortunately in St. Louis, we have shootings all the time. So it didn't occur to me that this was going to turn into the big thing that it was. As we were at dinner, we actually had the police reporter for the newspaper was actually babysitting our daughter and she's getting phone calls from her editor. Hey, we need to get on this. We need to, you know, be covering this. And so we get this right as our dinner starting to come, we get this message from her listen, there's been a, a mass shooting at City Hall in Kirkwood and I, I need to go in on this. Can you come home? And we actually had we were at this very nice restaurant. We, we said, listen, we're sorry. The food's great, but we have to go. And my wife was a reporter at the Associated Press at the time, and she actually got called into work then too. And so then I'm sitting at home with our two-year-old child and there's big news stories going on. I'm, that's just the way that first night worked out. The next night I was on the night shift and I was immediately started working and gathering and doing, um, doing things. We covered a big vigil that night, produced audio slideshows and videos and other things. And that, that was part of our contribution to the, the staff's entry there for the Pulitzer that year. That, that, that was some crazy nights. Um, you know, and I, I thought that was probably going to be the closest I'd ever get to winning, you know, being part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team. And, um, you know, then, then Ferguson happened. Your your coverage of that is incredible. Um, you sent me a print. It's the shot of the police officer with the uh, tear gas cannon firing, and it is like one of my most prized possessions. It's it's sitting on my wall. To this day, it gives me just crazy emotions every time I look at it. We'd been covering the event for about a week, and. We found that we were making the same pictures like again and again and again. It was like lines of police standing out there and and then lines of protesters and the police and the protesters would square off and police would fire tear gas and rubber bullets and, and other things and they'd threaten you with arrest and then everyone would scatter for the night. And it was sort of this this pattern where... You know, during the day, things would be sort of calm and, you know, we, and then as night fell, things would get more tense and we just became this pattern. And so after about a week, uh, I was talking with Lyndon Steele, our picture editor, and I was like, and he goes, what aren't we covering? And I said, eh, you know, you know, what we haven't shown is we have, I haven't shown what the guys from the, from the tactical team that uh, are, are experiencing. I said, uh, you know, what do you think the chances are they'd let us in and, and in bed with them? And he would go, ah, there's no way they're going to let us in. And I said, you know, I know the public information officer over at the county police department said, uh, you know, let me give him a call and just, just ask. So I, I call him up and I'm like, Hey, uh, so we were just talking about this and we, we, we couldn't figure out what we weren't showing. And I said, we've not shown what the, how the police are experiencing this. I said, you know, do you think it'd be possible for me to embed with the tactical team? You know, I have this experience from Iraq and Afghanistan and I've got, you know, a level four ballistic vest and, you know, I, I would be safe. And he goes, that's a great idea. Let me go check. And so he calls us right back and he goes, yeah, that's great get up here tomorrow at, uh, you know, at five o'clock and we'll, we'll get you in with those guys. And I said, Oh, holy shit. Okay, great. And so when I first get in, when I first in bed with those guys, um, they're all sitting in the back of this big armored truck and they, um, you know, I'm this member of the media and now I'm on their territory and they're like, what do you think of all this? And I kind of look at them. I'm like, uh Oh, you know, these are the same guys that have been tear gassing me and shooting rubber bullets at me and threatening me with arrest for the past week. And I'm like, well, you remember when you guys got up on top of the armored vehicle and you pointed the scoped 308 at the at the crowd there? They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we weren't going to use the rifle. We just we were just using that scope. That scope's really got really good optics on it, and we can look at what's going on in the crowd there with it. And I said, okay. I said. Yeah, but it didn't. It didn't look good, you know, to the crowd. All the crowd saw was you're pointing a scoped rifle at them. They go, yeah, yeah. I said, uh, did you have like binoculars? You know, because binoculars would have been a more would have been a less offensive thing for the crowd. They go, yeah, yeah we got binoculars, and and so like re that sort of diffused the situation and tension between us. And then they just kind of went back to, you know, to being cops. Um, 
I, I embedded with them a couple nights and um, I kid you not, like the first night that I was embedded with them, they were watching Black Hawk Down on their, on their truck. And I was like, how, how can you watch Black Hawk Down and then go out and do this? It was, you know, I didn't say that to them, but I was just thinking, you know, it's like, that, that was it was wild. It was just wild to see because it was like they were reliving what they were just been experiencing there and stuff as well. But that night we'd we'd gone out with them and uh, tip of the night there of the picture with the guy firing the tear gas round. Um, we went out with them and the police were out there and then the tactical uh, they they were squaring off with the with the protesters and a a line had formed along West Florissant Road and so the police finally called in the, ta- the tactical team. So the tactical team rolls on down there. And they get there and they make some arrests and stuff. And then they push further down the street and they're talking to people over the bullhorn, you know, please leave the area, you know, please don't walk on people's lawns, uh, please disperse. And the the tactical team, I'm actually wearing a GoPro helmet, uh, a GoPro on my ballistic helmet on this. And you can hear the the guys from the tactical team saying, they're like, if we fire gas, you're going to take this section, you're going to take that section and you'll take that section. And then you can hear the other officers go, what did he say? And so it kind of conveys some of the confusion. And about 30 seconds after that, there's there's gunfire. Three gunshots come out and you go, pop, 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 pop. And, um, you know, that that's when that picture is made. And you can actually see on the GoPro of the, of the exact moment when that, when that picture is being made. You can hear the shutter clicking and you can see the light coming down from the helicopter there that, that streaks across the scene. And there was just crazy. It was crazy, crazy nights in Ferguson. It was like one thing after, like I'd come on by my life. I'm like, oh my God, you wouldn't believe what you saw, what, what I saw tonight. And, you know, I kept having to remind myself that this wasn't Iraq or Afghanistan. This was an American city and on an American street. And it was, it just looked like a war zone for it at times. And so it, it, it was crazy. It's got to be a sobering thing, though, to see that in your own town. Yeah. And and then, like, you know, it was so weird because during Ferguson, we'd work on, you know, we were sleep deprived because you were working on the story all the time. And, like, you'd work on the story into, like, three o'clock in the morning. And then you'd get home, you'd be so spun up on adrenaline, you couldn't go right to bed. And then people would start calling you and asking for photos and stuff. And and then you'd and then you'd turn on the TV and the president of the United States would be talking about the things that you witnessed last night on TV. And... And I was like, wow, this is, it was, it was so surreal at times to be in the middle of that, of the biggest story at the, at the time happening. The, the way this story happened for you, you got a tweet. Is that right? That's how you got tipped off on this? Yeah. So I was, um, my wife and my daughter and I, we were all at Target and we were doing back to school shopping. And I got, I get this tweet from this guy, Tori Russell, who had started following on Twitter several years earlier because he was, you know, was harassing one of the local politicians online. And I was like, now oh, this guy's got something to say and I should follow this guy because the way I use Twitter is I kind of use it to listen to different areas of the community where maybe I don't have a lot of contacts. And so this guy was interacting with a politician who represented a uh, part of the city I didn't know a lot about. And so I started following him and then he spent the next better part of the next two years flirting with women on Twitter. And I almost unfollowed him multiple times. But funny enough, Tori is the person who first alerted me to, you know, to Ferguson uh, happening. And he sent me this tweet that said, hey, PDPJ, here's a story that needs to be in the Post-Dispatch. And it was a picture of Michael Brown's stepfather holding up a sign that says, Ferguson police just executed my unarmed son. And I'm like, all right, so there's been a police shooting. Yeah, I should, it's a big deal, you know, when when police shoot somebody, but it's not an especially rare occurrence in St. Louis. We average anywhere from 10 to 12 fatal police officer involved shootings a year in, in the St. Louis metro area. And so while while it's this is news and this is important, this isn't like a 747 crashed into the arch and, you know, all hell was breaking loose downtown. It wasn't something that made me immediately want to drop what I was doing to go there. So I called into the paper and I said, hey, are we aware of this shooting? Do we know what's going on? And they said, yes. We said, um, we're sending Denise up there and Hui Mock, our, uh, our photographer who was on that Saturday, is also heading there. He's dropping his assignment, heading up there. I said, okay, well, let me know if you need any help. But now, you know, like I'm, I'm still sitting there at Target and I'm still kind of interested in, you know, what's going on now because I've always kind of been a news junkie and I'm kind of following this and I'm seeing my timeline just fill up with more and more tweets and I'm seeing pictures of Michael Brown's body laying in the street. And um, 
I just I'm, I'm becoming more and more interested in this. And I'm talking to to Hui Mok, our photographer who's up there on the scene. I'm like, what's it like? And he's like, it's tense. I was like, do you, you know, do you need any help? And he goes, yeah, you know, why don't I could use a little bit of help? And so I said, great. Um, called my boss and said, I am going up to back up Hui. And when I got up there, they're washing Michael Brown's blood off the street. And the scene looks pretty calm. And I'm like, I missed it. I, I kind of pride myself on being, you know, a news photographer who gets there and gets to the scene quickly. But, you know, it's been now like at least four hours since the shooting happened. And, you know, when they're washing the blood off the street, it's because, uh, you know, they're, they're getting ready to take down the tape and, you know, open the scene back up. And so I, I my initial reaction was, is that I missed it and that I don't know why I bothered to come up here. So that that was a bad assessment on my part <laughs> because that was just literally just the beginning of probably what's going to be the biggest story of my entire career. Um, a story that I assume I will continue to talk about uh, for the rest of my life because, you know, it's funny that Ferguson, the small suburb of St. Louis has become this point which are, are people around the world know. They're like, you're from, oh, you're from St. Louis. Oh, right by Ferguson, right? Um it's interesting to be a firsthand witness to to history like that and history that's known around the world and not always mis- not always understood around the world about what what the events were and what was the series of events that happened. You know, it was a traumatic event for for our community here in St. Louis, but I am proud of the work that my colleagues on the writing side and the photo side and I think part of the reason why we were so successful in our coverage of the events in Ferguson was is that we knew the stories and the background of, of, of these events. Um, we'd actually done a series of stories 10 years before Ferguson. It was a three day series of stories called law and disorder, uh, that looked at policing in St. Louis and, uh, in the St. Louis region. And part of one of the things of St. Louis was, is that, you know, we're a, a county of 90 something different municipalities. And I think there was maybe 70 different police departments within this, uh, within this, uh, county and all these overlapping jurisdictions and, uh, and, and the way people police these different communities were pretty, you know, different based on if you were black or if you were white and if you had money or if you didn't have money. And so it, it was, uh, you know, it was a series that we were very proud of when we did. And when we did it 10 years before Ferguson, no one really paid attention to it. So when Ferguson happened and people started telling me about the abuses they were suffering at the hands of police, I was like, oh, huh, I know all about that. And, you know, we were able to have a common language. I kind of feel like in a lot of ways, a lot of the things I did in my career all built towards that moment in Ferguson in 2014, where, you know, I had had hostile environment training in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I'd done this big series of stories on policing in St. Louis before that. And and then all that experiences all came together in one in one story for me to cover uh, in in Ferguson, where I, I relied on all that past knowledge from my reporting on policing and all my personal experiences in working in the hostile environments from Iraq and Afghanistan, you know, to to cover this story in Ferguson that was 10 miles from my front door. Yeah, I, I think the other the the image that really stands out to me that kind of encapsulates all that is uh, the shot you took inside that store that was getting looted, and the guy's just looking right at you. Yeah, like yeah, that in was, that kind <laughs> of moment, are, how how scared are you about? Like, are, are you scared at that moment? Uh, like, how do you <laughs> how do you just keep going? All right, so that's a good story too. Um, you got five minutes for me to tell this story. Absolutely. Okay, great. So that um, that photo you're describing is from the second night of the Ferguson um, uh, riot. I shouldn't just call it a riot. Um, I, I don't even, the Ferguson protest, that's from the second night of, of that. That night was a riot. Um, there weren't a lot of other nights of riots. And they, some of the language around this can, can get tough. But um, right. so that, that photo is from the second night of the uh, Ferguson uh, protests. And... I'd been out there the night before and I made pictures out there the night before and police had had their dogs out and stuff. And I could tell that it was really tense. And I was talking to some people out there that night and they're like, Oh, there's going to be a vigil tomorrow. So I called my boss and I said, Hey, there's going to be this vigil tomorrow. I'm not working, but we should make sure that someone else is out here. And he goes, great. JB's on. We'll have JB Forbes cover it. And I said, good. And so I went home and I was kind of you know, still looking at Twitter from throughout the day and stuff because there were still more events. There was more protests taking place during the day out there on Sunday. 
you know, it was, it was clear the community was still very tense. And so this vigil happens, some police showed up and then parked a ways away where tactical vehicles, the, the armored trucks, police brought their dogs back out again. And so all this stuff was like ramping up tensions and stuff. And, and, and you could see the tension building between the crowd and the community and, and, and the police and, you know, like a pressure cooker, all, all these things were building up. And, uh, I talked to JB Forbes who was out there and I said, Hey, this looks tense. Are you, uh, are you, are you doing okay? And he goes, I just got, I just got threatened that, that I better get out of here. I better leave, uh, or something bad was going to happen. And I was like, all right. He, I go, so do you need help? He goes, yeah, why, why don't you help? And Robert Cohen, another one of our photographers at the paper w- was going up there and JB was already up there. And I, I said, okay, I'll, I'll be on my way up. And so I, I stopped by the paper and I grabbed some of our old 400 two eights because I thought we'd be covering this story from a distance. I didn't think we were going to be getting close to it. I, I look at this closet, and we call it the war closet. And uh, we call it the war closet because it's usually only gear that we break out if we're going to Iraq or Afghanistan. And I was like, you know, after being there last night, I should, in seeing the tension, I was like, I, I should just bring a bulletproof vest and, you know, a gas mask and a ballistic helmet, you know, you know just in case. And so I grabbed three sets of of ballistic gear, one for Robert, one for JB and one for me. And I grabbed uh, some of our long glass and I put it all on my car and I I drove up to Ferguson. And as I'm driving up to Ferguson, all these police cars are flying by me on the road at like 100, 110 miles an hour and stuff. And I can hear on the scanners that they're putting out aid calls for additional police to come up there and stuff. And uh, when I'm, when I'm driving up there, Beth O'Malley, our, our digital editor is like, Hey, it looks like this uh, this quick trip in Ferguson is the center of where all this stuff is happening. You should try to get there. I'm like, all right. And I, I use my Apple Maps there to sort of find where it is. And as I'm getting there, you know, I just I can't get anywhere close to that that quick trip because all these roads are closed down and the the police have just started blocking everything off. And so I kind of start driving through the neighborhoods and I backdoor it and I get to be about three blocks away from it. I'm like, all right, this is this is as close as I'm going to be able to get. I'm going to get out. And I'm trying to call Robert and JB to tell them the, where my car is so they can stop by and get get the gear if they need it. But, you know, all the cell phone service is all busy and stuff. And, and so I, I get out of my car and I put on a bulletproof vest and I strap a gas mask to my leg and I put a ballistic helmet on and I put my computer backpack on and I put two cameras over my shoulder and I start walking, walking these three blocks down the street to, to the quick trip. And as I walk one block, I'm like, I, what am I doing? I I look like an asshole. Like, why am I wearing all this stuff? And I like take off, like, I'm, you know, I'm in Ferguson. I'm not in Iraq or Afghanistan. And I, I take off my ballistic helmet and I strap it to my leg and I walk up another block and I hear gunshots and I, there's some screaming and I can see, start to see how really chaotic it is up there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to put my helmet back on. And I, I strap my helmet back on my chin and stuff. And I kind of walked up along the side of the the quick trip uh, and I circled it around to the front of it, you know, shooting some pictures with the 70 to 200. And as I was standing across the street from this quick trip, I could see that it had been looted and I had made these pictures with the 70 to 200. But if you were standing next to me, you would have thought I was a crazy person because I was literally talking out loud to myself. I'm like, all right, David, you need to get closer. You need to, you need to go over there. You need to walk across the street. And I'm, I'm saying this, I'm talking out loud to myself, trying to psych myself up to do this. And, you know, sure enough, a few minutes later, I'm, I'm walking across the street and uh, I stand outside this quick trip for a couple minutes and I'm talking with this guy. Um, I didn't know him at the time. Um, I've since I uh, have developed a, a, a relationship with him. His name's Andrew. And I'm like, hey, uh, crazy night, huh? And he goes, yeah. He's like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, I work for the, I'm making pictures. I work for the paper. He goes, oh, that, that's cool. And I, I go, uh, I, I stick my camera in the broken windows of the quick trip and I shoot some pictures and I can see that it doesn't look too crazy in there. And I said, uh, Hey, Andrew, next guy that comes through this, this broken window here, I'm going to follow him in and make some pictures of, of the looting inside. And I said, just keep an eye on my back. And he goes, okay. So guy goes in there and he, he grabs some beer and, uh, I can't remember what I can't, I don't have the picture right in front of me now, but he, he's coming around the corner. He's got some beer and, and something else in his hand. And he's wearing a Trayvon Martin shirt. And I go around the next corner and there's like this 14 year old kid there. And this kid's taking uh, two liter bottles of Pepsi out of the fridge. And right as I get done photographing that kid, this, this guy in the white shirt comes up behind me 
And he goes, hey, what are you doing? And I turn around, I look at this guy, and this guy is significantly bigger than me. And he lifts up his shirt and he shows me the gun tucked in his waistband. And I'm like, um, I'm a photographer for the Post-Dispatch. I'm, I'm taking pictures. And he kind of leans in and looks at me. And I say, your face is covered. No one will know who you are. You'll be fine. He goes, okay. And he goes back to, to looting the store. I'm like, holy sh. Oh my God. <laughs> right. So th- at this point, this is when the, now he goes back behind the cash register there. And now, now I make this picture of him. I make this picture of him standing behind the cash register. And clearly, you know, we didn't have the relationship that I thought maybe we had had from 10 seconds earlier. Cause he did not want me to make that picture there. I was in and out of the quick trip in less than two minutes. I think up about one minute and 52 seconds or something like that. And I can tell that by the timestamps on the, on the photos. I, I made this picture of this guy and I, I told you I was in there for like about a minute and 52 seconds or so. And I like run out the door and across the street and we're right on deadline where I mean, we're, I know that we're right on deadline. It's almost 10 o'clock now. If we want these pictures to get in the paper, I got to get them in there, um, you know, like right now. And so I go over across the street to this uh, car wash and I kind of take some shelter back there and stuff. And I open up my computer. I start trying to edit, edit some photos. I get it down to about 10 photos and I'm, my adrenaline is so jacked and so going so hard that I've lost the ability to type. Like I can't, I don't, I, I, for some reason I couldn't type captions. And so I just hit the upload button on the raw pictures and sent them straight back to the paper. And I told my boss, I'm like, Hey, these photos are coming in. They're from inside the quick trip. You know, what's going on. I like, I can't type. And he's like, okay. And so these photos start rolling into the system from inside the quick trip. And uh, my boss is looking at these photos and he's like, oh my God, look at this. And right at that time, our managing editor, Adam Goodman, comes over to Lyndon and uh, Lyndon Steele and says, hey, tell everyone out there not to take any stupid risks. And just as he's saying that, he turns the photo to, he turns and shows him the photo of the guy with the gun at the register and says, too late. (laughs) (laughs) So... Yeah, that that was not my greatest personal safety decision. That could have gone very south very quickly. How often do you let people know you're oppressed? Is it like most of the time or do you ever feel like maybe telling them that is a bad idea? I tend to be very open about it. I mean, I'm, I'm wearing two cameras on me usually and I uh, a fanny pack that I, I get mocked for wearing all the time, but I really like wearing my fanny pack. <laughs> I, I, I'm pretty open about it. I usually will wear my press credentials. Um, and I, I'd say I, I operate, you know, 90% of the time with my press credentials around my neck and two cameras and a notebook. And I'm very, you know, clear about what I'm doing and, and why I'm there and stuff. Uh, there are some times when, it, you know, it, you have to be a little bit more discreet, but I'd say, you know, 90% of the work I do is in a very disclosed fashion. Do you feel like the camera acts like a shield for you sometimes? I don't know if it's a shield. It's maybe more of an excuse for, for why I'm there. You know, just last week I was up at a neighborhood in in far north St. Louis, and you know, they're like, "Why are you here?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm I'm here because we're reporting on all these, you know, all this violence and these homicides we're having in the city. And you know, if I'm not up here, then no one's up here to record it. And um, you know, part of my job is to you know document these events that are affecting my community and put them on." the front, you know, put them in the paper for the, for people who don't experience this, you know, so that they are aware of the things that are going on in their community. I think that, you know, if we don't have journalists out there in the field and documenting this, then who's going to tell these stories? You know, I I think you can always have a discussion about how we're covering it and could we cover it better? And I'd love to have those discussions, but at a minimum, you, you gotta, you gotta be there and be, and be out in your community and covering this stuff to, you know, to be able to tell the stories. When you are reporting, how much how much of that time do you spend shooting versus researching the story and actually just getting out there? You know, I I, I will start off. You know, a lot of times a reporter and I will sit around and we'll talk about it beforehand, and we'll do some research and try to make some contacts. But then for me, nothing beats that that personal interaction and stuff. And and generally, I I find that people want to tell their stories. You know, there's some people that don't want to tell their stories and don't want to be part of it. But for every one person like that, I find that there's two people that do want to tell their stories and want you to photograph them and, and do that. And so I think the tricks are sometimes finding those people who who want their stories to be told and, and want to share their stories with you and uh, with the paper. 
How many photographers do you employ there at the at the Post Dispatch? We currently have seven photographers, uh, and one of those seven is shooting mostly video. And we have two editors, an assignment editor, and a director of multimedia, uh, Gary Harrelson. And th- that's down from you know we talk about the reductions in staffing. You know, I think when I started at the newspaper in two thousand, I think we had a staff of twenty seven or twenty eight people. I know how most of the papers feel about this. How do you, do you think there is still a place for staff photographers in in a paper type setting? Oh, absolutely. I think that staff photographers are an invaluable uh, resource for any newspaper to document it. You know the community's visual history and what's going on. And maybe five years ago now, the, uh, the Sun Times eliminated their photo staff. If you look, they're actually just posted a couple jobs to hire back new photographers. Uh, now this is under a different ownership group up there and stuff, but you know, that was a pretty short sighted thing that the uh, Sun Times had done up there because, you know, the idea that a reporter with an iPhone can, you know, replace what, a, what a staff photographer can do is, you know, is as ridiculous as the fact that I'm going to be as talented a writer as, you know, as our reporters. I always say that most of our reporters picture taking abilities are the best advertisements for, for photojournalists. Just like my writing skills are the best advertisement for professional writers. Uh, There are unique people out there that do are great writers and great photographers, but generally those two skill sets don't coexist in the same people at the same time. Um, And so I really respect and I love the things that a writer can do. And and I know our writers here also have a lot of respect for our photographers. Uh, What do you think the photojournalism world is going to look like in 10 years? Oh, I know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to still be employed as a staff photographer. I hope I am. I, re- I really like this job. It's kind of fun. I I wish I saw a, a clarity in the way it goes. Like, you know, we live in this weird time where there's this reduction of staff photographers and, and you know, people em- em employed full time by a company as photographers. But we also live in a time that's more visual than ever before. And you know, everyone's got an Instagram account and everyone's, you know, we talked about the quality of that, that, that old Kodak uh, DCS 520 camera. You know, everyone's walking around now with an iPhone in their pocket with a pretty good, you know, imaging device there and stuff. And I, I don't think that necessarily makes you a photographer, but the fact that everyone's carrying a camera now all the time, I, I think it makes us more important because of our ability to really make special pictures and not just ordinary pictures, but special pictures you know, not just anyone can go to a, a baseball game or a World Series game and make those really special pictures. It takes some planning and some forethought to do that. You know, just like those community stories, like, you know, if you get a skilled trained photographer in there to tell that story and really give it some visual impact, you know, beyond just snapshots, maybe maybe the, the trick is is the, to make it more a more sustainable future. Maybe freelance rates need to come into line with, you know, what the economic realities of being a photographer today are, because, Freelance rates have not changed much in the past, you know, 20 to 25 years. I mean, they're still paying, you know, $100 or $200 an assignment or, you know, in $300 an assignment. But that's, as an editorial photographer, you know, they're always having to supplement their their incomes do it by doing other commercial or corporate work. You know, I think it's very difficult now to be a, a freelance editorial photographer. Um, and I respect the people that are out there and trying to do that because it's a lot of hustle. Uh, at this point in your career, you've been doing this for... 20 plus years. uh, Do you still have any dream assignments that you would really love to do? Yeah. I wonder, I wonder what that, yeah, I don't don't know. Um, You know, I used to think I wanted to do uh, to to do an Olympics game, but then every time I talk to the photographers that have to cover that, like the waiting in line and, and everything where you're elbow to elbow with all these other photographers, like, yeah, that doesn't really sound so glamorous to me anymore. Um, you know, wouldn't, wasn't the dream for all of us, you know, at one time that I want to be a National Geographic photographer and get to go off for months at a time to tell some remote story. I think I'm happiest when, you know, when I'm not around a dozen other photographers that I might be the only one there and in te- in telling a story. So I, I think I'm happy. I think I'll be, I think I'm happy with any story that I'm telling that there's not a bunch of other people around. I was, when we were covering the baseball playoffs uh, a couple of weeks ago in, in, in Washington, um, the Washington Nationals had swept the Cardinals, but uh, the St. Louis Blues were in town to, for their visit at the White House. So I went to the White House to cover the St. Louis Blues meeting the, the president of the United States. And I was talking to some photographers there and they're like, oh yeah, you have to, 
get in line. Uh, you have to get there early. You know, this is a three o'clock event. They're like, well, you have to get there at like nine o'clock to put your ladder in line to go into the Rose Garden to stage your ladder at 11 o'clock. And then you have to leave the Rose Garden and wait around a bunch more hours. And then you go back in at like 2.30 and climb up on your ladder and make this picture. And I was like, oh my God, like, I, I don't know how you guys do this. This is like, you know, this is, it's really hard. It gives me a lot of respect for the things that they do and that they're able to make the pictures out of that because that's not an easy working environment there and stuff. So it really kind of makes me treasure being out here in the middle of the country away from all those other photographers. I think that's going to do it for us. Uh, we're really glad you came in and talked to us today, David. And uh, I'm really glad you're still out there telling those stories. So thanks for, uh, thanks for talking with us. Thanks for having me on. And it was, uh, hope, uh, hope it was interesting. Thanks for listening to the Lens Rentals Podcast. If you have any questions or comments, please let us know at podcast at lensrentals.com. I'll leave you with this quote from Win Wenders. Before you say cut, wait five more seconds. <laughs>